Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Riff Heart Podcast. My guest today, back for a second episode, is Mr. Manuel from Zeal and Ardor, which I think is really one of the most unique bands I've ever heard. It's really, really rare to hear somebody take black metal and do something brand new with it. Like, it just doesn't happen that often. And not just something brand new with it, but something that feels fresh and modern and isn't just like, the new thing is a new version of basement noise, like actual music with an undeniable identity. It's uh, it's great stuff. And I love talking to him because he is truly, truly a great artist and a really fascinating person. I also need to say that Zeal and Ardor have a new album coming out August 23rd called Grief. And from what I've heard, it is, uh, it's sick. Anyhow, here goes. Mr. Manuel, welcome back to the Riff Art Podcast. Hey, uh, treat to be back. Hey. Treat to have you back. So, I'm curious about something. Uh, you know, I was reading the press release, as there's several, um, and one thing I keyed in on was that it said self-produced. Yeah. Yeah. What does that mean? Because that's like, that could mean so many different things. I mean, it's the same as like the last three records. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. But um, the difference is that with the last, I mean, every record until now, I played all the instruments set in, uh, except for the drums. But um, this time around, every instrument is played by a capable person who actually can play their instrument. Why? Well, for me, Zealand Arter is at his best when we play live, and that's because of the people who, you know, give their energy and actually know how to play bass. And um, I felt like that would be Fair a enough. nice thing to to um, to steal. Steal that that's a that's a good a good way to put it. Did you ever did you imagine that happening ever? Like, I guess in in older days, did you imagine that? it would get to a point where you wanted to do it that way? I think it's basically just like um, uh, admitting to myself that I'm probably not the best bassist in the band or like not the best guitarist in the band or, not, you know, I can't hit certain registers vocally. Mm -hmm. And um, I think my ego thrives through my product. And if my product gets better through other people... I'm still an egomaniac, just not mm -hmm. doing everything myself. Okay, see, I like that. I like that a lot because um, I think when people get, um, when, when they start displaying too much pride about individual parts, I feel like they're, they're basically throwing away the bigger ego fulfillment that'll come from doing something better. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like a small-minded small-minded pride i think it's also cowardice because if you're proud of something that you've already done you're also kind of afraid to do something you might fuck up mm -hmm. and that's where i think is is the most interesting creatively but um that's very very conceptual it's a it's an interesting concept though so in this case do you would you say that trying it with other musicians would be the thing that could possibly be fucked up yeah, I mean, because like yeah. up until now, I know how this works and I could easily do like Devil is Fine too. I would just hate myself for it because it's just like, you know, being my own cover band. Um, and, it, you know, it's kind of scary. Like there's there's other people and there's their flavors and colors on this. People might hate it, but it's something new. And I think that's uh, that merits exploration. All right. Before we get back to this episode, I want to take a minute to talk about Riff Hard, riffhard.com, not the Riff Hard podcast, because this podcast is actually tied to our online school, Riff Hard. And if you're new here, it's the world's best online school for modern metal guitarists. You know, we've got hundreds of lessons from guitar players such as Javier Reyes, Jason Richardson, Wes Hawk, Dan Sugarman, Miles Dimitri Baker. Man, I could just keep on going on. Aaron Marshall from Intervals, Mike Stringer of Spirit Box. I'm reading now because 
I don't want to leave anybody off. Dean Lamb of Arc Spire. It just goes on and on. It's like all the best of the best. And you get tons more than just lessons with them. You get instant access when you join, but there's also all kinds of challenges. Like once a month, we do something like 10 day town picking challenge or a 10 day tremolo picking challenge or a 10 day alternate picking challenge where we really guide you through the lessons and make sure that everybody is getting better. We're not just not just giving you these uh, these videos and sending you out into the wilderness to fend for yourself. We are right there with you. We also do six songwriting challenges. Like we have a monthly one called King of the Riff, where we give you a brief, like write a Spartan war anthem or write a technical death metal song with like some criteria. And there's prizes that include guitars, guitars and cables and all kinds of cool gear. And we also have private Facebook and Discord communities of like mind and supportive people, no assholes. That's really, really important to include. Now, with Riff Hard, you also get a subscription to Nail the Mix. They live under the same site. So in Nail the Mix, you get to learn how to mix metal. You also get access to Buster Otto Holmes' Beginner's Guide to Recording Metal. So if you're just playing guitar and trying to record yourself, you have a band and you want to make demos for your band members or uh, you want to make your own demos, but you just can't get them to sound anything but garbage or you just can't get past the starting gate. It's too complicated. We've got you covered. Uh, Buster Oda Home will show you how to do it. And also, if you want to take it further and actually learn how to mix, there's no place better than Nail the Mix over at URM Academy. And that's all included with Riff Hard subscription. All right, so if that sounds interesting, you want to check it out, go to riffhard.com. I'll see you there. And uh, let's get back into this episode. Once lots of bands get to a certain level of being established to where I hate to use the word brand, but like there's an established brand, there's a fan base. It's been going on for a while. There's a thing they're known for. It works. And, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe they've been able to make that their, their jobs. And that's pretty fucking cool to to be able to do that lots of times i think there's there's a an i guess a tendency to stick to stick to what works cuz it's kind of a miracle that it even worked in the first place and i i mean there's also you could you could tell i mean i could be accused of arrogance to say like you had something that worked perfectly people liked it now you just because you're so fucking special you want to do some different shit who the fuck are you to like dictate it? Um, but the thing is, I I could do Devil is Fine too, but it wouldn't be like honest. It would just kind of be phoned in. And I think that um the audience would notice that. They can sniff that. In, in my Absolutely. opinion, they could they 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 could smell it. I, I think if if like the thing that that worked involved authenticity if you remove that from the equation you're kind of removing something really really important that people would connect with absolutely yeah so i, I guess like take taking that risk um is it still even though like the actual risk being taken is adding other people uh, has your mentality changed at all I don't think so because um i started this project with just with the ambition to make music that i liked then it turned out people liked it too and um with that came um the persuasion of i should just like give them what they want but that's kind of dangerous because that's i no longer make music that i genuinely like and it's it's just kind of a pastiche of myself. And like for this record, I actually had basically like 30 songs that sounded like old songs of mine, but just like without the heart. And I just have to notice like this is no one wants this. I don't want this. Certainly I don't. And um 
like what I got is other shit. And um, all I can do is fucking share it. So what did you do it. with those 30 songs? Uh, they're they're on a hard they're no they're in Dropbox to be even okay, so less romantic about it. Are they like finished? Like fully, fully finished? Uh it's just like demos. Like they're they're as finished as Devil is Finals. Like there's MIDI drums and shitty guitar to <laughs> But like they're yeah, but they're written. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. So you ditched 30 songs. That's awesome. Oh, I did way more than that, but that's just how I write. Like I I I'm not very like romantic about writing. I get up at nine, go into my fucking room basement thing, come back out at like midnight and maybe five percent are good. The rest is just it's about volume. I guess you're not worried about it in the moment. And that's kind of key, I think. Like if, if I'm thinking about like ooh, what what do people expect of me? That's the moment that I'll I'll make a really shitty song. <laughs> does it take uh does it ever take a while to get to the good stuff? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, like ninety five percent of what I write is just kind of mid or shit, and it's about the the other five percent. Yeah, it, I really think that people limit themselves by getting too uh, too precious about what they write and don't just write more. Yeah, so I have a rule that I don't um, take old ideas and try to make them into songs. Mm -hmm. because I might as well just do a better one because I have more experience now. And yep. Yeah. And, you know, maybe something, you know, gets lost by the wayside, but I mean, fuck, man. <laughs> Who cares? Let's make something interesting. I mean, if you're writing every day or almost every day for that long, there's yeah. a reason why you didn't pick it. Absolutely. fucking loopy. Yeah. Yeah. Has there, have you ever broken that rule? Um, not for myself, but like ghostwriting for other people. Yeah. Like it's not for myself, so I don't have to perform it, but so I write like pop songs for people or like, you know, theater music or whatever. And then I'll just take a melody that I've, <laughs> I mean, to be mm. quite transparent, um, I'm, I kind of phone it in sometimes if I don't really care about a project that much, so. Um, so there's been one or two theater pieces that I've um, had the privilege of uh, indulging in an old melody. Well, <laughs> I mean, if they like it, that's, I think that's what matters. I, man, so, okay, so when you write, uh, how do you know when a song's done? Um, like, if, if, I, if I work on a song, I really like to finish it as... as in, in the process of being like infatuated by it because I have the disease of kind of working on something until it's no longer the initial idea. So I really like to keep things fresh unless it's like a very conceptual thing. <clears throat> I really like to have the emotion that I initially felt while writing the first idea carry through the entire process. So um, I just finished the fucking song. I don't, <laughs> there's no, no rule to it. But like, is it like something where some songs take a week, some take a day or like, I know that John Lennon, for instance, had a rule of like, you finish it that night. I'm pretty much in the same camp. So what I'm trying to say is like, this is John Lennon. This is me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Precisely. That's exactly what I'm getting at. <laughs> No, um, it's just, I think it's it's just the phoning in thing again, because if, if I come back the next day and I no longer feel the same way, I mm -hmm. can't really convey that feeling any longer. So I can't really finish that song anymore. It'll be a different song. And I think it just dilutes the, 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 the urgency and the emotion of, um, of the song, melody, lyric, what, what have you. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. I mean, you can never really recapture a moment. Like Exactly. Moment's a moment. And that's the fucking magic about music. You know, there's that fucking time travel aspect of it. 
you know, like your favorite songs, you know exactly when you listen to them the first time. And mm -hmm. it takes you back to that. So there's this like, there's this time capsule element to it. And I think um, that's also, I'm trying to respect with that. You know, I think like when, you know, when bands have lineup changes and change or whatever, and fans get mad about that and want more of whatever it was, mm -hmm. I think what they don't understand is that even if the band stayed the same, they wouldn't be giving you more of whatever it was because they're not the same people anymore. Yeah. I mean, even if they're the same, uh, like the same humans, they're not in in the same place that they were like 10 years ago or 20 exactly. years ago. They're not going to do Iowa again. No. Because they're, they're beyond that. They're, you know, they're, they're, they already grown. did that. They already did that. That record actually already exists. So if you want more Iowa, guess what? There's a, there's a button that plays <laughs> the entire album again. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I think people want to hear it for the, I think what they're really saying is they want to hear it for the first time again. Yeah. And that's hopelessly romantic when you think yeah, about it. It's like, so, yeah. Unfor yeah. Sad. But, uh, but I do think that that's that what beautiful. they're saying. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You're, you're totally right. That's, that's absolutely true. Yeah. It's, it's unfortunate. I know. I feel that way about movies too. It's like, man, I wish I hadn't seen this so I could see it again, but mm -hmm. oh, well. Oh, well, <laughs> just never watch it. Never watch or listen to anything. Then, uh, exactly. Then, just eat styrofoam in, yeah, in a white problem room. solved. <laughs> Pro problem totally solved. Mm -hmm. How have uh, people reacted to the, the new singles? I mean, I mean, they sound like you. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, the first one was like the softest song we ever put out. And then like the second one was like kind of one of the hardest we put out, which is funny. But I mean, like people who don't like us, they don't really comment on our videos. There's a couple who said like, oh, just derivative, which I find really funny. <laughs> um, but I mean, other than that, I more of the same shit, more of the same shit. Oh my God, shoveling too much fucking no. It's, it's so funny because, <laughs> uh, there is, there's wildly diff different opinions. There's people who say this is oh, fuck, yeah, I knew they, they'd do this again. And there's others like, I, I'm so disappointed they went this way. <laughs> it's like, what, what, where are we going at? And well, so, that's more of a reason for why it's just a bad idea, practically speaking, to try and deliver on a formula. Because exactly. you're kind of guessing. It, no matter what, you're kind of guessing. And there's, you're always going to end up disappointing somebody so I think the best bet is to just trust your own instincts because your instincts are what got you there in the first place. Precisely. And um, guess what? We have to play these songs for like at least two years. So yeah. I think I'm going to make an effort that I like these songs. So I have at least one 100% sure factor of a person likes it. And the rest is, you know, take it or leave it. Um, yeah. So that's that's how I roll. <laughs> that make that makes sense. So when when working with the dudes in the studio, uh, did you guys do the modern thing of everyone record on their own, or were you were you there? Uh, I was always there, except for one bout where I had um, this cool thing called Lyme's disease. <laughs> oh shit. Or my half the, half the, of my face it sounds, decided, that sounds like a great time. Super great. Yeah. Um, you know, couldn't hold water in my mouth because I couldn't seal. Um, this is this is a little bit of tangent, but um, so they they did this thing where they took the juice of my back. Yes. So, uh, yeah, alum whatever the fuck. They yeah. Lumbar, whatever the fuck. I don't know how it's called in English. Um is this a spinal tap? But yeah. I should have known that. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, I, I, I couldn't emote with my face and I was in, in Switzerland in this hospital here. So they took the spinal tap and there was this doctor right in my face saying, this is fine. You know, this is a very renowned hospital. Um, Steve Jobs was here and Tina Turner. And I, as a joke said, but they're both dead. 
<laughs> but I couldn't like <laughs> smile. So it's like the yeah. most awkward <laughs> thing. It just took me. They're both dead. It's like, uh, all right, yeah, like who survived? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us about people that uh, got out of here alive. That was a long minute, man. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, uh, well, I had the demos and then we replaced every track gradually with um, the bespoke instrumentalist to answer your question. In, yeah, in person. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. And uh, uh I'm this is this is interesting to me because hearing the stuff that's been released it very much sounds like I uh know you guys the sound. So mm -hmm. if I didn't know that there were uh that it was now the the band the live band is on the record mm -hmm. I wouldn't have guessed it cuz it just sounds like it doesn't sound the same, but it just sounds like, you know, sounds like your new record. <laughs> so, it sounds like the sounds like you. So, um, so what I'm curious about is, did you have to try for that, or is it just you've been playing with these guys, and it's just molded itself, and it just works? It's even beyond that. Like if I write a song, I have them in mind. And I know mm -hmm. what they like and what they like to play. So I kind of like, I do, yep. I program like drum fills. I'm like, he's going to get a fucking kick out of this. So it's like these micro presents that I put into songs for them. So that makes sense. Yeah. It's a, it's a symbiotic or parasitic. Yeah. And are they, I'm guessing that the way the setup, like, it's just, seems like it happened organically too right yeah yeah i mean yeah we've been playing together for fucking eight years it's not it's not like we're they're like baffled by oh no i need to play a, a sad melodic fucking bass line they, they know and there, there's a there's a certain formula or there's a certain vibe to my my songwriting in in this project and they know it and they fucking do it better than i do and that's why that's why it works so well. It yeah. works. It, it's just, it's an interesting thing to me um, because uh, I've always felt like bands work when everybody understands their role in the band. I, I don't mean fans like a band. I mean, like the band unit works as mm -hmm. in has a chance of not imploding uh, when everybody kind of understands their role whatever it is and are cool with it and are just cool with cool with how the organism functions yeah. and lots of times when you have scenarios where there's this one uh main writer or one visionary um you can have either like band members who are cool with that and you know will go do their own stuff on the mm -hmm. side or uh yeah they kind of understand that this this is what it is um it's not for better or for worse this is what it is but then i've also noticed that sometimes those situations implode when uh people don't understand aren't actually cool with the with the way it works I mean, they want to impose a different vision onto it yeah um i don't think that's that like there's a you know dichotomy shift or like a envy or something going on because we're very it doesn't open. seem like it no it seems like r really cool really organic and the way it should work because it's also like a schrodinger's songwriting in a way because if if i I'm like in a super position because if, if I invite them to into the songwriting process and we kind of equalize that and it's good, I will kind of hate myself for not doing it earlier. And if I include them and it's shit, I'm going to hate myself because it's shit. But like in this, my, my very cowardly position, I'm like, I I am the cat in the box. So this this is a, this very comfortable and I will say, yeah, coward, cowardly um, position. Or it just kind of works. And there's, yeah, there's no like ego or 
envy going on. Like we we know this is a it's a project that I write, but we can actually perform together way better than I could do it alone. Yep. So in in many ways, I this is this is a band project, even though if I write it. So yeah. It's it's actually kind of trivial who writes it, I think. As long as it's game. Yeah. <laughs> I think that if people are in a project like that and they have a problem with it, just don't be in a project like that. Yeah, but I mean, right? maybe you don't get to choose it, you know? Maybe you, this is like the one chance you have. To this is the tour. one that worked. Yeah, and then you're in an <clears throat> uncomfortable position. And I think that merits, you know, discussing. And if... You know, maybe there's leeway. Maybe there's there's ways to 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 restructure things. But um, this works for us at least, at least until now. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's not like one formula that just fucking works. That would be way too easy. <laughs> yeah, I get it. It's it, this is this is just a topic that uh, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, oh, really? Yeah the the benign the benign dictator but non-dictatorship the benign musical the both dictator and non-dictator who insists like, he's not a dictator the yeah. democratic dictatorship like it's 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 hard to it's hard Music to define mouth. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's hard to explain because um in this type of scenario uh it where it's legitimately a band and so band members legitimately have have their own voice coming into it mm -hmm. however it is within the the scope of somebody else's vision that's an interesting thing to 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 make work because there's still going to be a limit to where an outside idea coming in might not fit within the scope of the vision anymore and that's where yeah. i think that there has to be an organic understanding to begin with like it's something that you can talk about it, of course, but I think that there has to be this hard to explain, but this organic understanding and uh, like almost chemistry musically to where it's just cool. I mean, there is that with us because everyone in the band knows I'm not I'm not a brilliant instrumentalist. I mean, I'm barely a guitarist, but I have been writing songs every fucking day since i want to say 16 years that's what i know that i can do i know i cannot slap a bass i'm certain i can't do a blast beat but i can i can suggest one i can put that one in a demo and i can make it sound good in a bigger scope but the practicality of it and the execution of it i am shit at and i think it's also them knowing that I am live. I'm nothing without them. So it's a codependency. This could be either, like I said, either be symbiotic or you could read it as the parasitic and codependent. <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends on what the end state is. We're happy campers. Yeah. Then it's I mean, that's me. So you have to ask them. <laughs> my, my, <laughs> the dictator always will say. <laughs> We're, we're fine. This yeah, is democracy. <laughs> They're just a little hungry. It's fine. <laughs> They'll get over it. Yeah. Well, it's good for them. Oh so when, when picking the songs for the album, is, uh, is it, so you get, let's just say for on this one, you come up with 30, not cool, come up with a bunch more, uh, and then, you just bring it to them and are like, these are what we're doing? Or is it like, all right, here's 15, pick 10? I I pick them. Okay. That's that, that's the benevolent dictator again. Because, um, I don't know why, I'm just control freak. That's the, yeah, there's, I don't, there's no um, rationalizing that. No, it's got to be your vision. That makes sense. Yeah. It's not a bad thing. I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I don't think yeah, it, I'm fine with it. Put it that way. <laughs> well, the, the thing is that music works because of somebody's vision. So you get some cases where the vision of the 
of the band is something that organically was multiple people who came together like suicide silence or something where it was very much like a band band that did did that yeah. thing that worked for them um that's definitely not like a singular person even though i think garza on the business end like definitely was like that dude um i think uh from what i understand like it was very much like a a band band vision get together in the room and it just works and you have those types of scenarios so if you were to go fucking with that equation it might not work um yeah and i and i think that at the end of the day what people connect with is it comes down to some sort of an organic vision and it's uh it's important to preserve that it is and it's also important not to fake something because i think I mean, we could push come to shove. We could like collaborate on writing an album, but I'm I'm not certain it would be good. I'd actually be kind of afraid. Maybe it would be better than everything I could write, but I don't know. It's um. Have you done that before? I despise writing music with other people. <laughs> I love performing it. I love yeah. writing for other people. But what do you dislike about it? Compromise. Because I, I'm not a stickler for like details. I really like the big picture of things. And, um, it's also about pace. I, I write really quickly and unromantically. Um, not, not to say without emotion, but I have a healthy detachment to it that I, I, I will I will never fall in love with a demo, for instance, and say, no, this is perfect. We can't record it differently. It would be just it would spit on the grave of the idea. It's no. I I I'm very pragmatic about that. And I don't know, maybe I'll meet someone who um who who shares that the same visions, but uh, or intentions, but I don't know. This is like one of my favorite things to do in the world. And I tend to do it alone. Simple as. When you do that, when you write, um, how you said you, the pace is part of it mm -hmm. for you. Um, do you write? Do you move fast? Is that like? Because you, know, you said you're there from nine a.m. till midnight. Yeah. So um, if you move fast, that's like a lot of music. It is. Like I have. I have quite the backlog. <laughs> Not saying it's good, but I have quite the backlog. But what I mean with moving fast is um, as long as I'm infatuated with an idea, I want to pursue it and not um, get distracted by, oh, but is the kick pattern here good? Could we do a, a different reverb on the snare? I need to have the fascination and the infatuation with an idea to to actually convey it. To, to 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 make it a song i have to be fucking in love with it while i do yeah. it. yeah yeah and i imagine that detail work you can just do later absolutely yeah. yeah and that's also where like band members like a really good drummer can come into the equation so do you very quickly decide if an idea like when you're writing uh, if an idea is not good or good or can be developed or should just be ditched is that a very a very binary yes no um what's well, it's later on because while i do it i think every idea i'm working on is is this shit it's amazing and then like maybe an hour later i'm like ooh, that was not fucking great but i for me to work on something is i have to i have to like it it sounds very yeah. you know banal and simple but that's music has to make you feel something so i have to feel something i, I yeah. feel like no matter what you have to feel like it's the shit while you're working on it and then it's almost like you're in a haze like a drug-induced yeah. haze and then you come you sober up and realize yeah. that some of it was cool and some of it not so cool and it's also like this weird space of you you don't allow self-doubt for a minute mm -hmm. or not in that aspect 
So you don't really question yourself. I'm generalizing or projecting like this. I don't really question myself. I was like, this is, yeah, this is brilliant. This is, I, I should do this. And then maybe <laughs> two days later, I'm like, maybe saxophones are fucking shit, Manuel. <laughs> it's just, so they're yeah, not. Yeah, but you got to go into it with that confidence. Yeah. It's not even confidence. I think it's just a lack of reflection. You just do. And I think uh, that's that's what that's what really is my forte. I do, and then I um, revise and edit and delete and archive. <laughs> the d the revise and edit uh, does that happen that first day? No, no. That's uh, that's later on. If I really like something, I'll I look at it and like, okay, this is a great structure. This is a good idea, and then I get into the nitty gritty of it. Like, yeah, say fucking snare reverb or maybe guitar tones or what have you just details i, okay. I zoom in for lack okay of so term. so day i'm just trying to i'm trying to understand how this works mm -hmm. so day one uh you're talking like the big idea like the the dna i guess mm -hmm. the dna mm -hmm. or the bones of it either a yay or nay basically precisely um, yeah, and then at some point later, uh, it's it's more uh, what would it be left brain work, like ed yeah. editing and but refining. Not, not exclusively. There's still you know there's still obviously emotional components to it, but it's it's way more um, detail oriented. So I got mm -hmm. the scaffolding, and then like okay, I'm gonna, I yeah, I have I had the word scaffolding in English, but the rest um is just in German. <laughs> So drywall and yes. paint. The drywall, yes. After the scaffolding, <laughs> does it, it does it happen way later or like it next depends. day? Or, it depends. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is because if I'm asking is, do you wait until like the initial high from the song has faded to come back and revise it? It depends. I think there's always that distance i think that's that's also kind of crucial because you can't be like in the honeymoon phase with the song when you finish it you have to have a little bit of a of an uh objective or distant or uh, yeah I'm, again i'm pro projecting um i have to have like a little bit of an objective view on it mm -hmm. because i can't just you know i can't be in the this is fucking the shit everyone will love it i will never doubt it I mean, yes, in the first, you know, steps of it. But after that, I think it's kind of healthy to to be a little bit of, you know, uh, critical. Not self-deprecating, but like, sh should Make we it better. really? Should we really have that many kalimbas? Is that, <laughs> is that, is that a good decision? <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, I, I find where uh, the writers that I, that think are better uh the thing that they tend to do which uh which i've noticed uh lots of writers i don't like as much uh tend to not do is really intense revisions once like they they don't care about it not being a finished product on round one but then then mm -hmm. you know then they will do whatever's necessary once they know that they love the idea. And I, I've noticed a lot um, uh, with people who haven't quite found their thing yet that mm -hmm. lots of the time it's not because they're not talented. But it Lots of times it's just because they don't spend the time to find their thing. They just don't do it every single day and then come back to it and refine it further and because do what it, needs to it's, be done. It's, it's it's wholly unromantic and it's it's not a nice process because you, no. you have this beautiful idea and then suddenly you have to be critical of it and kind of be an asshole to yourself. And I think that's for me that's a really important step. But it's it's not the fun part, I guess. Or is basically if I were a teenager, Im imagining myself being a songwriter, yes, I have these ideas and they flow out of me all willy nilly. I never think of, and then a week later, I take it into the editing room and I um, I focus on the parts I hate. 
but that is important. That's to me, that's really important. Yeah. You need, you, you kind of need both. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So was there ever a time where you were afraid to write something shitty? Is, is this something that you had to learn, like a learn, like a learned skill of just writing for the sake of writing and knowing I mean, it's a volume game? Maybe at the very beginning, but I really early on, I got into the groove of, I'm just going to write and um, there's no merit in focusing on, oh, I wrote a shitty song, but there is mer merit in what did I learn from this? What did I found shitty and how can I write another better song after this? It's just, it's, it's, even if it's a shitty song, there's gradual growth in it. That's how I see it. When you have a shitty song, uh, that basically goes to the archive, is it basically dead to you? Absolutely. Yeah. There's so no, you, yeah, there's no merit in like wallowing and, oh, it could have been. And then I'll just fucking romanticize a shitty idea for ages. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah. I mean, I, I really subscribe to the notion of it was, it wasn't picked the end. Like there's a reason it, sometimes mm -hmm. you can't define the reason, but there's a reason. Yeah. There might be like cool aspects to it, but it wasn't picked the end absolutely yeah but also i am finding myself not being the best chooser so there was this one song called gotteldämmerung which i i like that heard. song I, I now i've grown to like it too but it's that basically sick. it's like a dum dum riff it's just dur, 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 dur. and i thought this is the the stupidest idea i've ever done uh, people will think it's like, like the most stupid, dumb, dumb riff ever. And like people from the label said, this is going to be great. You have to put this out as a single. No, no. Give them, give them the slow jams. That's what they want. That was stupid me talking. So there is also a bit of a disconnect, but that goes back to what I like versus what the audience likes. And, um. I guess I'm not my audience. Well, yeah, you can't you you can't control how other people will react to it. And by the way, you're not the the first person I've known to have said those exact words. Like, uh, like I, I I've known quite a few people who some of their biggest songs they personally didn't understand why people like them. They thought that they were like their they're like trailer park riffs or like they're like they're like they're one one person did say like this is just like my stupid riffs like i mean look yeah. honestly i think and this is a little bit of a stretch but i think that's the appeal of taylor swift not saying she's trailer park or anything like that but the thing is it's such a non-specific emotion that it applies to such a broad segment of the populace so if if i tell you you yeah, when my grandfather from mexico went to cuba and then he smoked a green cigar of that and that make that's a very fucking specific story but if i tell you i was in love it hurt i think it's more likely you'll emote to that or relate to that and i think that's where the dumb dumb riffs in a weird way come in because it's not a specific like, ooh, they'll they'll notice my jazzy fucking fling into a jig. But it's more like, okay, this is a very fucking guttural emotion. And maybe that's all we need to know. And I think that just speaks to wider. A wider I, think, I think you're right. and But I also, or not but, and I also think that when someone feels that way about one of their riffs, that ends up being in a popular song or feels that way about one of their songs that ends up being popular to them. It, I, I feel like to them, it, they're interpreting it as very, uh, I guess, a, an underdeveloped version of what they're capable of. Like, this is like, this is just like, I could like shit this out. This is not like, this is not what, this is not peak me. Or something like I you know feel like the, there's the this like best, this pride thing. There's the wait, hold on. 
Um, in der Höhle. Um, the best example of this um, is Edward Grieg, who um, was this uh, classical composer from, from, I think, Norway. And like, as a shit takes, like, you know what would be shit? Like, I'm just going to do like this stupid Scandinavian fucking melody. It was like a piss take. It's his most famous fucking piece. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's how it goes. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, I, I mean, didn't, I didn't realize the Hollow Mountain King was uh, was a joke, but it was that makes sense. Yeah, I mean he did like Morning, which is it sounds like Morning. You can, yeah, it's it's a good track. Track <laughs> piece. It's a great piece. Um. But yeah, it was a piss take, and I think he would fucking wallow in his grave, knowing that that's his most recognized and probably also loved piece. It's great. Yeah, it's so recognizable. Mm -hmm. But I think, but I get it. I, I I didn't realize that that he felt that way about it, but I can see why. Uh, but I mean, it, I I feel like it comes it comes down to that thing i was saying where probably in the composer's mind something like that is i'm capable of so much more like my expression goes way deeper than this this is just kind of like the most base level of what i do and i do i have a hundred more of these like what i i don't think so you know what it is i think it's mm. also the composer allowing themselves to do something that they actually want to do because like got to them i loved writing that song it's not like I, I hate it it's the dumbest shit like everyone who likes it is an idiot i i love doing that and i think also edward greek with in the hollow mountain king of course yeah it's a pastiche of you know scandinavian stupid melodies but it's like this is a banger and like he, i think he got lost in it and even though he might not ever fucking admit it he had, he's kind of proud of it. This is maybe something that he just didn't allow himself to explore. So in your case, you enjoyed it while you were making it, but then when it came time to pick a single, you are you didn't like it anymore? I did like it. I just picked a shittier single. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because that song's a banger. Oh, it's so fun. Yeah. It sounds fun. Like, it, so it sounds like, a song that's fun to write, fun to play. It's fun to listen to. Just, mm -hmm. it's just a banger. It's, it's so yeah. It's interesting to me that that wouldn't just like stick out to you as a very obvious, as a very obvious choice. Yeah, but I think that that's also why I say that you know that editing mindset. Maybe that didn't really happen enough, where you like take distance to what you wrote. Uh, maybe be it a day or a week later and like, okay, this is, this is that. Um, yeah. Fun shit. Yeah. But yeah. Also though, you can't, you are not inside other, you'll never experience it the way somebody who didn't write it experiences it. Yeah. And I think that's as beautiful as it is frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I have very precise and specific ideas to what my songs mean. And then someone's like, okay, this changed my life. And they're like, no, but you you read it wrong. <laughs> How do I have to say that? Like, okay, my dad passed away. No, actually, it's not about your dad. Um, it's about <laughs> so, but that's that's also the beauty of it. It's no longer mine. No. Yeah, once you put it out, it it is no longer yours. But that that's definitely been something that's that I have not totally wrapped my head around is how other people interpret like you know you'll you never be able to see yourself live mm -hmm. like, you have no idea what what you're like live <laughs> that's yeah it's frightening actually yeah you can watch you can watch it but it's not the same because you're watching yourself so yeah like you don't have that impression of it it's it's a totally yeah. different experience yeah you're you're right on the money there yeah I'm sure you've had people come up to you and tell you that a song saved their lives or got them out of a hard spot and their interpretation of it, like you said, was just not what the song was about at all. But it is. 
I think yeah. like at that point, their the, the, their, that's what's so fascinating. Their view is just as valid as my silly view. And I think the shittiest thing to do then is like actually no. Actually, no, you're wrong. <laughs> that's <laughs> no, fuck you. Because that I mean, if with my self righteous fucking intention, who gives a shit if if it fucking helped someone? Even be it's you know, something trivial. It's 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 worth more through that. So what do you think about when directors, movie directors, uh, get very particular about how people consume their movies? I think, I mean, there's, there's, there's levels to it. I think if you're looking like, if you're watching The Fall from Tarsum, maybe, maybe a silver screen might be cool. But, um... I don't know. Like, I, I, I think I'm a shitty example because I grew up with MP3s and like shitty fucking MP4s of movies and TV shows. So I'm, I've never been very particular about how the medium is presented. But I, I mean, fuck, I could, I, mean, I never picked lenses for a scene, but there are people out there who picked specific lenses. Or a scene, and I can't understand that they want to, they want people to feel, see, and you know, enjoy the lenses that they picked. I will yeah. never notice the fucking lenses. Well I, well, I think in terms of like like a Chris Nolan movie where it's shot on IMAX cameras and like the scale of the story and the scale of the imagery is designed for taking it in a certain way not like on a laptop or mm -hmm. something. I think there's there's a parallel there to somebody hearing a song and taking something away from it that isn't what the song was about. But it's still perfectly valid for me to watch his movie on my laptop. Exactly. Because, I mean, I would be a dick if I would say, look, for instance, we did like these surround mixes for Apple Music. That's how it's called. Um... If I if I were to say if you didn't experience the album on surround sound blah 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 you haven't experienced the album that's fucking bullshit because I know for a fact that I want to say ninety nine percent of my audience listens on fucking earbuds. Mm -hmm. Um, I I listen on earbuds and um, it's Me kind too. of it's it's kind of a shit take you know to say oh I I made this thing you paid for you. Or like I made this, I made this pasta for you. You suck at eating it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Um, it, that was a bit the tangent. idea that it's it's no longer yours the moment you put it out. Yeah, and you have to be at peace with that, Chris Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I get where he's coming from though, because if you've ever seen one of his movies the way it was intended, it's like a whole other experience. I haven't. I think that's it's, the point. It's a whole. It's a whole other experience. However, yeah. that's not to. So, like the the question is what? So you're just not supposed to watch it. You, you exactly. can't get into the the perfect scenario, and then like yeah. you're not maybe, allowed to enjoy it. Maybe I live in fucking Botswana. There's not an IMAX cinema where I'm at. But guess what? There's exactly. torrents. Do you want to? Do you want to say no? No, you shan't see my movie. Well, it's, yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's a different experience, granted, but it's it's st the soul of it is still there. And yeah, I don't totally. think that that, um, you know, being blasted in surround sound from Hans Zimmer in your talks and, you know, having your retinas grilled <laughs> by a huge screen makes that much of a difference. Sure, it does. But the story is still there. Yeah, uh, and at the end of the day, no amount of uh, loud loud stuff can make a, a bad story good. No amount of surround mixing can make a shitty song cooler. Except for our album. Um, which Except for your <laughs> album. Hey, the mixes sound good. Yeah, that was um, Andrew, no, Adrian Bushby um, of Foo Fighters and Spice Girls fame, which is exactly our niche. <laughs> yeah, that sounds... That sounds right. I'm not yeah. familiar with him. 
Uh, he also did Muse. That's like a like an indie band from uh, the yeah, UK. So, 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 yeah. I heard like they a, won some like Battle of the Bands. Yeah, I think they're going to open for us. Like they're going to support us on a tour. <laughs> Who knows? But, mm. If they're lucky. Who? Yeah, uh, he's way too good for us, but we we were lucky to have Adrian Bushby. Mm-hmm. So, one thing I've noticed with like non-metal dudes mixing metal records is, uh, is that they don't sound traditional, and sometimes that's a really cool thing, and sometimes it's way off the mark. Uh, it, it sounds right with your stuff i think in part because you're a non-traditional band so yeah it but works. i mean expanding on that i'd rather fuck up interest it's inter interestingly than you know being another one cookie cutter I mean, yeah i think that sounds you know demeaning but i mean i this is our music is weird and i think we can expand on that even with people who are in different roles so I mean, the vocals are super fucking loud. It, it's mixed like a pop record. Mm -hmm. It's more of a rock record than a metal record, I, I would say, just mixing wise. But I think it's fun. Even it's if it's a fuck up, even if this is our Lulu, it's a fun Lulu. You know, I don't think it sounds like Lulu. It it still sounds nasty. It oh yeah. Sounds yeah. It's still it's got it's got the stuff. It's just uh, it's. So I think that where it's good to go with a non-metal guy is especially when you have non-traditional elements, because sometimes in my experience, the metal mixers that are like, this is their specialty. So they do every single day and they're great at it. But when you bring in a band that's got all these other elements that are outside the wheelhouse, those elements will become backseat to like your standard metal mix with in general there's there's exceptions to that i mean we there's, there are exceptions yeah. but in general yeah we mixed with kurt kurt polluted a mix oh, which was he's, amazing he's, he's great yeah and um fuck i'm blanking um the other guy the not kurt must, have, must have been awesome yeah um no. who is not kurt blue you know Who's who that? i'm talking about the other hard crunch. <laughs> Shit. The, the other, uh, God. will yep. Almost. No, not him. Um, no. Fuck. Kurt Ballou. I think if I Google him. Kurt Ballou sounds like a great mixer for you guys. I didn't know you worked with Kurt. That's a, sounds like a great choice. Yeah. He did a uh, stranger fruit. So yeah, he, he a, he's, he's phenomenal. Um, I'm such a fucking idiot. Um, yeah, I'm just going to fucking kill myself after this for not knowing he did. He did wait, actually, I'm just going <laughs> to, this cause you and this is so fucking <laughs> the worst. Kind of amazing and pathetic. Well, um, oh my God. Oh, well, let me ask you something. Did you interact with him? Of course. Yes. Yeah. Will Putney, I'm a fucking idiot. Oh, Will, yeah, yeah. yeah. William, uh, he's awesome. The so other about, Will. about not editing. Um... <laughs> <laughs> we we could cut that if you want. I, Will Putney can know that I'm an idiot. No, can... he, I think he'll find it hilarious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> three records with us. <laughs> oh God. Um, no, Will's great. Yeah, yeah, and he. I mean, he does like his nine to five metal mixes and he, I think he incorporated our, you know, left field elements brilliantly. So yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I think for him to have like this out of the wheelhouse elements was kind of like fun, I guess. So he kind of leaned into it. So it was, it was, it was really cool. Same with well, Kurt. Yeah. Well, Kurt and Will, I would say are great choices. Uh, they, when I, when I made my grand sweeping generalization i wasn't thinking of them uh they're oh, like believe me will, i yeah. neither was i <laughs> yeah will will and kurt dudes like jens bogren like they can make anything work uh, in mm -hmm. my opinion mm -hmm. uh they're just they're just great mixers um but i'm gonna look into this adrian fellow because uh 
he's got a really interesting, really interesting take on your stuff. Yeah. He also did my solo project, Bird Mask. Um, he's, he's a fucking cool dude. Like you'll, we had like one call with him over Skype just to, to show him where our mic's at. And he said like, you know, do this lower blah, blah, blah. And he had this enthusiasm of guys, do you realize that our job is making records? We're fucking living the dream. And it's not like he just said this because he needs to say it. He felt that he had this fucking glee about him, which is fucking brilliant and infectious. Great person. And refreshing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. I feel like uh, I hear a lot of people talk shit about, metal or music when they're in it and i i make a point of not letting that infect my state of mind because yeah. the way i see it is it's fucking crazy that metal has basically paid for my adult life that's that's a great thing i have a roof on my head yeah because i yell at people that's yeah that's wild, awesome man that's insane it's insane and it's a great thing mm -hmm. it's uh yeah, it's it be being around that enthusiasm uh is infectious and and is refreshing. It's great to find people, especially a mixer, uh who still feels that way. I think especially with a mixer um because it means that they're probably going to go the the uh the distance. Got yeah, weird with it too. It's amazing. Yeah. Where's he out of? The UK. That's what I thought. Yeah. Muse yeah, and spy skills. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit him up, see if he if he wants to come on the URM podcast. I think he would. He would first of all be a brilliant guest, and I think he would be up for it. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll hit him up. Like that motherfucker has stories. Like, yeah, I mean, sounds like it. Did you <laughs> go to the UK? Uh, not to record. Like we just sent him the files. Normally, he just um, he produces, engineers and mixes, but he really liked my silly project, so he made an exception. I'm special. <laughs> oh, very special. So, so you did like internet mix notes. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's I, we couldn't have put it lamer, but yeah, that's that's exactly what no, no. Happened. That's I mean, that's how it's mostly done these mm -hmm. days. It's a uh, and I, I feel like the best mixers these days have learned how they become like musical interpreters to where they can take whatever those, however those notes come in yeah. and understand, understand how that translates into the things they have to do. Well, here's the thing I produced for other people and I've mixed for other people and I, I know what, what's you know what's what's can you make it more sparkly that's oh sure yeah it's like i'm just gonna the sparkler meter not the sparkler up, yeah the up sparkler. To 10. we're quite concise with our feedback but also like i couldn't imagine every, anything worse than having done a mix and then the artist is in my studio breathing heavily through their mouth to my back going i think here guitarists should have more bottom it's no no let's let's as a society let's and that's very bad <laughs> yeah it, some mixers prefer that it's crazy i don't understand it mm -hmm. but uh that's probably why we're not mixers <laughs> yeah well yens man yens told me so here's the thing with working with yens so i went to sweden and i was there for two and a half weeks and I wasn't allowed in the control room. Like I shouldn't have been there for two and a half weeks. I should have been there for like five days because he didn't really let me in the control room for a week and a half just because he does it. So he likes to mix alone, but then when it comes to notes, he'd rather do it in person because he just thinks it's a lot faster. It's a lot faster to, but he's rare. Most people don't like anything in person. But I think that's also like um, there's a little bit of pride in the mixer because if you don't do it in person, you're not immediately accountable. So you can still, if you insist on putting that reverb there, you kind of finagle it in. It's fine. They'll then give two rounds of feedback. 
little rest reverb. Sure. <laughs> little rest, less reverb. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And it'll still be there. I think there's also that that prestige to it. You can make it your own mix. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's uh, depends. Man. Yeah. Have it. Yeah. I I don't know where I s stand on it because I when I used to mix, I hated having people in the room with me. Hated it. Mm. I was surprised that Jens wanted me in the room at the end there, but I guess if I feel like if if you know that it there's going to be a lot of notes and not uh, not dumb stuff, but like there's there's this is complicated, and there's a million ways you could interpret it. So mm -hmm. if we're in the room, we can communicate quickly and get it done. That kind of makes sense. Also, if it's in the end, like if you already have like a, a basic like rough mix set up, and it's not yep. like, well, the kicks, I can't hear the kick. Yes, I haven't fucking added them. You fucking yeah, you imbecile. But <laughs> if you have like the you know the, the sticks and stones of it already set up, and then you can just kind of tweak it to their liking. That's a different thing than having them uh, in you know in in the control room from the beginning. Oh God, man, the, you just brought back some memories. I'm so sorry because <laughs> we've been there. <laughs> the uh, the I the is this what it's going to sound like? I haven't even you haven't even started working on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Trigger. that was more than one, I can tell. <laughs> it was a lot. Yeah. It, it was a lot. It, I'm sorry. It, no, no, it's it's okay. No, that oh. was, I mean, that what I realized is, so I have lots of friends that are producers and mixers, and this shit, even if it bothers them, it doesn't bother them that much. Like, there's a lot of stuff that mixers and producers deal with, that just doesn't bother them that much. Like not getting paid right away from labels. Like a lot of them are like, of course they'd rather get paid right away, but sometimes labels take a while and they're chill about it. And lots of mixed notes, they're chill about it. Like, do they want a lot of mixed notes? Not necessarily, but, but it just doesn't tweak them the way, or like band members being like, really disorganized or like unprepared would they prefer that they're prepared yes but does it like really get to them no but that shit got to me and that that's how i realized that this isn't this isn't what i should be doing because mm -hmm. like i like i don't have the temperament for it like these dudes i know who uh are really really great at it they have this temperament where that stuff just doesn't bother them um but like, for instance, with like, I don't know, with like booking stuff for nail the mix or, or whatever, uh, you know, we've had a lot of stuff change at the last minute or all kinds of, all kinds of crazy stuff dealing with labels and artists and producers and licensing and things changing and just, and it never stresses me out whatsoever. So. But I think it's just the distance to it. And sometimes even if I, even if I do not like the record. I still identify as this is kind of my baby, mm -hmm. even if I fucking don't like it. And then I just don't have the patience. And it's not my place to be impatient because, first of all, it's not my album. I'm getting paid, like, regardless. So who am I to be irritated right now? But I, I still can't distance myself enough from the project to say... Fine, yeah. It's just you know, do your do your do your thing. Take your time. It's yeah, uh, yeah. It's frustrating. But they're cool with that. That's the thing. They will. That's a. So that's an interesting one because when somebody has requests that you feel are gonna make it worse, mm -hmm. I've noticed these dudes all have this this thing where they will tell you what they think. But if you really want it, they'll just, the switch in their head goes off to, it's like, okay, I don't care. I'll do it. I think Your that's record. the thing. Like it's because even as a musician, I, um, like I offer a service and what they do is also offering a service. And there's this little, this this little 
like a, it's a scale of am I an artist or am I just offering a service? And sometimes you just kind of fucking take a step back and then you just service. You're you're just delivering the goods and I can't do that. As hard as I might try, I I, I fucking can't. I care. And I Fair can't enough. not care. <laughs> yeah. Know yourself. Yeah. I think I think that's the the moral of the story is no so know come yourself. produce with me i will uh <laughs> ignore all of your fucking feedback and it will make it sound like a zealand art of record you know what some bands want that yeah but yeah yeah, oh, fuck. yeah i've I, I i have had bands come in and i know lots of people have had bands come in with zero opinions of their own they just want you to do that thing that you did for some other band. I did that with fucking Will Putney. Um, you told him to just do what he did for... Yeah, I told him to do um, fucking, what was it, uh, digital... Whatever. There was this one fucking editing guitar thing. And he was like, yeah, so I, I heard your demo. It's kind of harsh. I'm like, yeah. And he, he tried to fucking fit it. I think he knew exactly what I wanted. He was like... Maybe you want a little more organic? Like, no, actually, you kind of go digital veil hardcore. <laughs> and he did it. He did it. I think that was for him. It was like, okay, I am I am the service man now. Mm -hmm. And I might have, yeah. But that's, that's a fucking quality. Because Yeah, absolutely. In the end of the day, it's just me being a fucking egomaniac and not, you know, being able to step back. But it's, it's all, yeah. But it's also Mixer understanding their role in the process and not but it's i mean not you know, their, it's not their band yeah but i mean there's also scenarios where a mixer is fucking integral to yes. how it all well, is. it's always integral so they or just have to know creatively. they just have to know where the line well yeah they so they have to they have to know where there's this line and the line is different in every scenario i think like Every artist has different needs. Every song on every record has different needs. Uh, and every personality will interpret input differently. And uh, the great mixers, under, like they can see that line or know how to find that line. Mm -hmm. And if, if they need to put in a lot of input, they'll put a lot of input. If they know that it's better to just let the, let the artist steer the ship they'll make sure the ship's working properly. I think there's so much psychology with being a producer. You have to like, you know, create this space where people feel fine to, you know, do this or that, or maybe like egg them on or whatever. But I think it just comes down to figuring out how lost they are. How, how yeah. lost is this artist? Where, where does my, my realm start? Because every artist is lost in the studio. That's just how it is. And it's just about figuring out how far do I have to take over? Is it, you know, how far do I have to babysit? Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to put it. The ones that I think don't last, uh, that I've seen don't last, or who might be really good but end up with, like, bad reputations, even if they put out hits, um tend to not read the room right with that that question right there yeah um or there's another possibility which is that the artist doesn't know how lost they are so like so i've heard a lot <laughs> of stories about an artist going to a genius producer and mm -hmm. getting the best record of their lives and the most successful record of their lives and them hating the producer the whole time and hating that record and never going back to them uh and then years later being like actually this is kind of our best record and so i think sometimes the artist doesn't know how lost they are it's so this is interesting it's this interesting dynamic of yeah absolutely yeah because some people are are some people know that they're lost and need some guidance and not not always but I think it's a good place to end the uh, the podcast, man. I want to okay. thank you for taking the time to chill and talk some shit again. Yeah, this was beautiful. And I think we yeah. 
meandered and uh, ranted. It was really nice.